All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alina Das. I'm a professor here at NYU Law School and co-director of the Immigrant Rights Clinic. Um, and very excited to be here with you all um, and those of you who are joining us online um, at NYU's Law Forum. And we're really excited today um, for you to, to hear from these three amazing speakers who are going to help us uh, truly reimagine what immigration policy can look like from the lens of how New York City treats asylum seekers. Um, so to join us today, and I guess I'll start with the um, person closest with, to me and, and move on down the line, um, we have uh, Julia McDonald Nieto del Rio, who is a reporter with an outlet called Documented. Um, Documented is uh, the go-to source for immigration news affecting New York City residents. Um, it is a source that NYU uh, Law School and its students have relied on. I know in many of our cases, our clinic represents people facing deportation and works on immigrant rights campaigns. Uh, we often go to, to Julia for a source of news and to other reporters that documented. We cite those articles in our briefs and our policy advocacy. Um, and we know that Julia has been really on the front lines, um, really documenting what has happened to asylum seekers in New York City. Uh, so really glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have um, Adafe Akoro, who is a leader in the um, uh, refugee and asylum rights community. Um, as you may know, if you have read his incredible book, um, Asylum, which is a, a memoir and, and manifesto, Adafe has been a true leader uh, for LGBT rights um, globally, um, has been a leader for refugee rights, uh, formally led a refugee shelter for people here in New York City, um, is the executive um, director for Refuge America, um, and is directly impacted himself having come to the United States seeking asylum, expecting a welcome, and instead being detained across the river at Elizabeth Detention Center. Um, I first learned about Adafi's uh, work through First Friends of, of New York, New Jersey, an organization that stands in solidarity with people detained. Um, and our clinic has really been inspired by his voice and others um, to fight against the uh, atrocious conditions at Elizabeth um, and to fight for its closure. It's a private prison um, that is still operating to this day and recently sued the state of New Jersey um, for legislation that New Jersey passed to try and end and, and the contract there. Um, and so very grateful for, for your leadership and insights as well. And then last, we have um, Council Member Shahana Hanif, who is also um, the City Council's uh, Chair of the Immigration Committee. Um, and uh, Council Member Hanif has been an incredible leader on these issues, has been holding the city uh, accountable for many of the policies and programs um, on immigration issues, as well as other issues affecting New Yorkers. Um, our clinic was very inspired by the very first um, hearing that um, the council member held on immigration last year um, to look at conditions affecting detained New Yorkers. Um, several students uh, testified at the hearing. Some of our clients testified. Um, and it has been incredible to hear um, uh, council member Hanif's voice again and again asking the questions that we really need answers to. Um, and pushing for changes and for legislation that will help um, New Yorkers, including many of the, the thousands of people who have recently arrived as asylum seekers uh, to New York City. Uh, so before I begin with some of my questions for the panelists, and we'll save time, of course, at the end um, for questions from all of you, I just wanted to start by explaining you know, why we think it's important to look at asylum issues from the lens of what we do here in New York City. Um, as many of you know, asylum policy is in complete disarray, um, and it's not just the policies that uh, were announced during the last um, federal administration under the Trump administration. Um, those policies used the COVID-19 pandemic um, and other global events as an excuse to really gut asylum law to prevent people from being able to apply uh, according to the laws of this country um, and, and really uh, imposed rules that would create incredible hardship um, for people to be able to come here and to, to avail themselves of the legal process. Um, but of course, those, those policies have continued under this administration. Some, some of them have been 
there's been attempts to change them by this administration that have been halted by our judicial system. Um, and others are new creations, most recently the announcement of the asylum transit ban by the Biden administration, which is just another attack on, on asylum law and policy. So we could spend the whole panel talking about those laws and policies, but we're not. We're here to talk about New York City. And why does that matter? Um, well, I think to understand that, you really have to take a page from history. Um, in the 1800s, if you can think back to then, New York City was really the hub for people coming to the United States um, seeking refuge. Um, at that time, there were no federal laws um, that were excluding um, people or, or creating additional requirements to come federally. It was really about people being able to somehow arrive to the ports here to go to Castle Garden and be processed by the state um, into, into this state and into this country. Um, and it was during the 1800s that you started to see a growing rhetoric around who deserves to be here, about the state and the city starting to say to the federal government, well, we don't like who's coming here. It, this puts a burden on us. It costs us money to care for people. People are too poor, which at the time was really rhetoric around the hierarchies of race, of class, of gender, and religion um, that were so prevalent in so many policies um, of the time and continue to be so today, perhaps not so explicitly. Um, this rhetoric created a desire from the state for the federal government to get involved, to take control, um, and they did. Now, it's not to say that the federal government didn't have some humanitarian reasons for stepping in, creating Ellis Island instead of Castle Garden, uh, creating laws around inspection and processes for people to come in in an orderly way. There were some humanitarian reasons for that. Um, but a lot of it had to do with the rhetoric of exclusion, um, a, an ableist rhetoric, a classist rhetoric um, that combined with the racial hierarchies of the time, anti-blackness, um, anti-indigeneity, uh, a focus on who deserves to be here, and from the West, at the time, uh, growing anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, those things all came together to create our first federal laws, and, um, and they were seen as responsive to the demands of, of New York City people who said that they, you know, there's just too many people coming and they needed assistance from the federal government. So you have to wonder, what if instead of um, leaning into this narrative about burden, about cost, about scarcity, what if New York City and New York State at the time responded in ways that, that really tried to welcome people who were entering here, who came up with policies that allowed everyone, whether they were coming here from abroad or coming here um, from another state, to be able to live in New York City and New York State and flourish and thrive? Would we have the federal system that we have today? Would Ellis Island, which was, you know, phrased as an inspection center, but quickly became a detention and exclusion and deportation center, would that be something different? So now we're at another phase where thousands of people have come to New York. Some came here volitionally. Others were bused here by states like Texas in a publicity stunt. They're here in New York City, and we're starting to hear the same narratives around burden, about costs, about wanting the federal government to do something. And we have to wonder, is that really the appropriate response? And what are we inviting um, by framing things in the same way that we have always framed them? And what does it mean for New York City residents who are struggling with many of the same issues about being welcome and included here, whether or not they are citizens um, or non-citizens? So that's the framing for this talk. And I will talk no more, but um, pose some questions to our panelists who really know uh, what's happening on the ground. Um, so I'm going to start an opening question uh, to Julia, because you have been reporting on how asylum seekers have been treated on the ground in New York City. You've gone to the shelters. You've talked to people um, during a lot of the, the concerns, some of the protests that have been happening. Um, what are you hearing from asylum seekers here in New York City today? Um, how have governmental and non-governmental groups in New York City tried to meet these needs? And where are you seeing the gaps? Thank you so much, Alina. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I'm Julia, so I've been covering the asylum seeker crisis for a couple months now. Um, and to take a step back, um, at this point, about 47,000 asylum seekers um, have arrived in the city 
um, since last summer. Um, and of those, uh, still about 29,000 are under the city's care. So a significant amount. Um, and officials, city officials recently said that there are about 13,000 um, kids enrolled in uh, New York City public schools. Um, the city has responded in a variety of ways. Um, obviously, it's a difficult situation. Um, I believe the city is in the process of opening its seventh um, humanitarian response and relief center, um, has opened more than 85 hotel shelters for migrants across the city. Um, and they have been pushing for services. For example, um, the Asylum Resource Navigation Center in Manhattan um, has been uh, an important tool for some migrants to find um, some mental health care, uh, limited legal assistance, um, help with enrolling for uh, health insurance, things of that nature. And um, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs has also been uh, partnering with um, local organizations uh, who are um, more connected to these communities and um, can really hear directly from them to, to help out. That said, um, there's still a lot of gaps in city care that um, these non-governmental organizations and mutual aid groups are um, stepping in to, to cover. So that can be anything from receiving calls in the middle of the night that an asylum seeker was turned away at a shelter or is told to go to a different shelter after doing intake. Um, migrants may not know where that shelter is. They may not have Metro cards or money to do that. Um, so mutual aid groups have been stepping up to send Ubers or show up themselves to help get um, asylum seekers from one point to the next. Um, faith groups, churches have also been a place of support. So um, I went to one church a couple months ago where asylum seekers who had fled shelters were sleeping um, on benches, receiving warm food there, um, also getting work training there, things of that nature. So, And it had also created a community for asylum seekers to get to know each other. Um, a lot of Venezuelans who had made the same dangerous trek throughout many countries to get here um, and were able to kind of provide a sense of support to each other as well. Um, and many individual New Yorkers uh, who have given migrants a place to sleep themselves or helped um, even pay rent for certain apartments um, or, you know, help find work for folks who are looking for it. So those are some of the gaps that have been filled um, by New Yorkers who have um, been here maybe a little longer than the recent arrivals. Um, and to talk about these gaps a little bit more uh, specifically, um, in my conversations with asylum seekers, I think one main thing um, that I've uh, kind of seen is that the resources that the city is setting up really need to be made um, accessible for everyone. So for example, if someone is placed in a shelter pretty far out in Queens, um, but there's this Asylum Seeker Resource Navigation Center in Manhattan, does this person or family in Queens know that this um, center exists? How can they get there if they may not have money for a Metro card? Um, are there workers at the shelter who can share this information with them? Because if um, asylum seekers don't know about the resources, obviously they're not going to access them. And that has been an issue when I've been um, speaking to folks um, who may not know about the resources that are accessible um, through the city or through other organizations. Um, shelter conditions are obviously a, a really um, big issue. Uh, so first of all, I want to say that every single asylum speaker, uh, asylum seeker that I've spoken to um, has told me how grateful they are for um, the help um, from the US government and from the city. Um, so I want to highlight that. Um, but there are, of course, things that can be better in the shelters. Um, food is sometimes really difficult. Kids are hungry. Um, they have to eat the same meals over and over, microwaved. Um, some kids have gotten sick. Um, I've heard from parents that they've gotten sick from the food. Um, I've seen videos of cockroaches in the shelter rooms, um, just, you know, uncleanliness, um, for example. And recently, uh, obviously, there was a situation at the Watson Hotel where, where the men were told to move from the hotel um, to the center at the at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal in Red Hook. And, and that is something that has been happening or people receiving notices that they have to change shelters or now it's time for them to move shelters. So for folks who have already been through such a difficult journey um, and not maybe finding a sense of stability finally for one or two months, but then being told to move to a completely different area of the city that may be more remote or further from a job or 
anything, um, that's, a, that's a big uh, additional challenge. Um, and, and mental health care, too, I think is something <coughs> that is um, overlooked, I mean, in general, but um, especially for this population who has gone through um, a very traumatic journey often to get here. Kids who have had to spend time in the Darien Gap. I met a 12-year-old who spent his 12th birthday, um, you know, in the jungle and gets here and everyone's in survival mode. But um, what happens down the line when, when these traumas start to come up and, and uh, there's no real um, kind of place for people to access this mental health care or um, to find find this mental health care that they really need. There may be some, so, there are social workers at shelters and sometimes at schools as well, um, but a more consolidated way for these asylum seekers to access the care they need is really important. Um, we spoke with um, the husband of, of a woman who tragically died by suicide last year at a shelter in Queens. And, and what her husband told us is that, you know, she was separated from him at the border. She had to come alone to New York with her kids who were 15 and seven at the time. Um, and she wasn't allowed to leave her kids alone to go out and look for work. Um, so she didn't have any income, um, anything really to do in the city. And so she was becoming more and more depressed and had been separated. Um, from her husband by uh, immigration authorities. So that compounded the grief that she was feeling. Um, so those are you know, just some of the anecdotes I've, I've been hearing. Um, language services obviously are, are still, uh, I think, a big gap, and that can be at shelters or across the city. I've heard from some migrants who say they do not have anyone who speaks Spanish at their shelter, or um, that person only shows up occasionally. So. Obviously, there's just no way for them to really communicate or access the care they need if they don't have someone who speaks their language. Um, and one of the biggest things, obviously, is work and legal assistance, which I think is super tied together and that I'm sure a lot of you <laughs> have been helping out with or heard of. But there are not enough lawyers to help all these folks or folks don't know where to find lawyers or even just legal assistance. So um, obviously, asylum applications can be complicated. Um, and they need assistance to fill them out. And once they fill them out, they can get their work authorization. But in the meantime, they're just waiting. Or you know, people don't want to break the rules. So they're not trying to find work outside of these rules. Or they are, but they're worried about it. So it just creates a lot of stress. Um, they're not familiar with the immigration court system, which is super complicated. Um, and so anyways, both of those looking for work and legal assistance are, are huge things that are very intertwined. And I think some of the most important things that I've heard uh, when I've gone to Federal Plaza, most of the people I've spoken to have not found any legal assistance. When I went to the Catholic Charities Help Desk one day, um, they only have limited lawyers who are able to help. And a lot of people were turned away, um, unfortunately, despite obviously lawyers wanting to help. So um, it's a really tough situation. And, and without work, I think, um, you know, people came here to, to, they want to give back, they want to support their families. Um, and if they're not able to work, it, it makes everything just so much more difficult. So those are a couple of things. Hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And I, I'll just add, um, you know, on the, on the legal point, right, it's important to remember too that you know, these are the few people amongst many who are actually able to come into the United States despite all of these terrible um, policies at the border. They are following this process that is, is supposed to be set out for individuals to come to the border, to apply for asylum, and to, to be let in, and then go through the process that you were describing. Um, and then immediately, it's very difficult, right? And they're, um, the work authorization that they can get once they apply, there's still a waiting period. It raises these questions, why does somebody need to apply to have to work um, in the US and then be faced with this kind of burden narrative when they, you know, if they could just work, um, they would be able to help find um, resources for their families, but it's really laws that we create that make it so difficult for people to find that structure. Um, and with the asylum application, there is a bit of a, a ticking clock. Um, there's a one-year bar in asylum law that essentially there are some exceptions, but you are supposed to apply within a year of being here, and yet it's so incredibly difficult. So I just wanted to, for the law students out there, to add um, that information. Thank you so much, Julia.
Um, so now I wanted to turn uh, to Adafi. Uh, you're a leader in refugee and asylum rights with deep experience, not only as a person who previously ran an organization that pro provided shelter um, to asylum seekers in New York, but also as somebody who's navigated the system yourself um, after fleeing you know, horrific persecution. Um, based on your experience and expertise, what do asylum seekers and refugees need to thrive in the United States, and how can our city be doing better? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start as a two-part question with the city. When I came to the U.S. in 2016 to seek asylum, and I moved to New York in 2017, there was not really like access to shelter, and some other services that have changed within the last seven years. So it's the effort of activists that have made this possible, and I just want to mention a few of them. Uh, the right to shelter which the city passed means that everybody that comes to New York City would have a right to shelter. So I think New York City is like the model of what it means to work on people, but because it's also a very uh, economically hustle and bustle culture, it makes it difficult for a new person to sometimes find these resources. So like undocumented people in the city now have access to identification, such as city ID, and they can also apply for benefits when they have this identification. New York City, I think in 2018, did the universal legal support for all asylum seekers that comes to New York City. They can have access to legal support but there are only a few lawyers. The language and translation services through 311 makes it possible for a lot of people to have access to language. The mayor office of immigrant affairs and activist community are trying to fight for um, green card orders to be able to vote as part of like making laws in the city. So a lot has changed in the last few years that make it possible for people to come to this city. That's why this political stunt of bossing immigrants to the city is because they're trying to overwhelm the system that New York <coughs> is trying to create to be a center for welcoming people. I am an activist. I try to push the city to do better, but I will give credit to where credit is due that New York, in terms of like the entire country, in terms of like welcoming immigrants to like a particular city, like the immigrants who have told you of their experience that they're very grateful for what the city does, I would say the city is listening most of the times. But we are in a new era. And in this new era also comes new challenges that have never been seen before by other administration. And one thing that has happened recently is that I don't think the uh, Adams administration do listen to people in the immigrant community and activists that are trying to change how people are being welcomed. Because most of the times, it's people who have expertise do know what the needs are and how to create that need. Like when I came to New York, I discovered that shelter was a big issue and I pioneered the only shelter in New York City that was giving access to immigrants to have housing. And I just want to give uh, uh, a nugget of something that happened, that transpired then, that would be an example of what it means to create a thriving community for asylum seekers. So while I was running the shelter, somebody came from Guyana to seek asylum in the US. And while they were seeking asylum, they lost their parents. So they were staying in the shelter, they couldn't return back to their own country. Like a group of Americans came together, they did a candlelight vigil. And I remember the person telling me that he never imagined that he would find a community in America that could be like a family to them. And in 2019, they decided to become an uh, EMT, emergency technician. And in 2020, during the pandemic, I, I remember I spoke to him. I was like, how is life? He was like, it's very overwhelming. I'm working day and working night, trying to get people the care they need. And it reminds me of, the drive that pushes people in the first place to come to this country is that why we see on the news every day that immigrants are coming to America, I think they're trying to come and contribute to the 
the zeitgeist of what it means to be in this melting <coughs> pot, so-called American project. But the main issue we don't seem to face most of the time is that why there are this, because I've been in America for about seven years now, why there are issues as regards to like shelter, food, and clothing. There's some, a tear up that is like something we don't tend to confront is that when an immigrant comes to New York City, for example, access to economic opportunities are very, very limited. And in terms of like reintegration into a new society, the city try to like create that environment, but the communities they try to find themselves in sometimes are hostile to them. We say that uh, we are New Yorkers, we want to welcome immigrants, but if those immigrants are going to be placed in an hotel in the neighborhoods of people, there's always this confrontation of like, not in my backyard, but it can be in another place. So the problem most times is, even though the city try, the communities are not as welcoming, quote unquote, mm. as they say they, they, they are, or as they profess to be. And I do live on the Upper West Side. I know that it's very difficult for you to like rent a place because you have to provide 40 times the, 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 the monthly rent for you to prove that you have that ability to rent a place. And you need um, to have social security, a good credit score. And sometimes this become a barrier to be like, okay, I will just take a job that will enable me to survive rather than me go look for an opportunity because I have a bachelor's from my own country. So people tend to abandon the skills they have or they can provide and take anything they, they, they see so that they can be able to thrive. I am a gay person. When I came to the US, someone told me, are you HIV positive? I said, no. He said, you're going to find it very difficult because there's housing for people living with HIV and AIDS and if I'm an immigrant, I can assess that housing if I test positive. But if I don't, it's almost impossible to find housing. So someone, someone told me that his friends told him to have HIV so he have access to this housing so he can be able to have a place to stay. And I do know people who end up engaging in sex work so they can have a place to stay. I wrote in my book, there's a transgender lady that came to my shelter, Jenny, and she, she said to me once that she tried to sleep in somebody's couch, like in New York, I said, come and stay in my couch or something like that. And the night, the person wanted to have sex with her, and she had to run away from the place and came to the shelter in the night. And in New York City shelter system, there's no classification for like trans people to have a, a, um, a male shelter or a female shelter or a non-binary shelter. Mm -hmm. There's no like classification. So if your birth certificate says male and you have the features of a female and they put you in a female shelter, it's sometimes hard to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And if they put you in a male shelter, it's also hard to use the bathroom. So it's like there's complication because there's no um, thinking above that tier of like, this set of immigrants who come to America. So I think the, the, the major thing is like reintegration into a new society, thinking through the intricacy of how do we <clears throat> provide policies that reduces discrimination. Like New York City have like 21 classification that prevents people from being discriminated in public places, in shelter, um, Section 8, housing, and so many other classification. But like she said, some people who come to America are like, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I'm new in this country. I don't want to take this uh, landlord that refused me housing to court. There's backlog in the housing court. So it's, it's like a ripple effect that they end up falling through the crack of the economy and sometimes sleep on the streets because they're like, People who sleep on the street in New York City, it's not like there's no shelter for them to stay in. But when you, I, I did stay in a shelter for like two weeks, my first two weeks in um, New York. When you stay in a shelter and you are not a drug addict or you don't have like a mental health issue, it's very difficult for you to stay with people who have mental health issues or drug addicts. 
So it becomes very difficult at night to sleep. Some people are like, I prefer to sleep on the street than sleep on the shelter that I wouldn't feel safe at. Or I prefer to have sex with somebody to give me a place to stay rather than go to the city shelter that I don't feel safe at. Or I will engage in sex work so that I can have a place to stay. So I do think most of the times, like when we think about laws that protect us, how does it fit into our modern day life? Like any country that have lived as long, city or state that has lived as long as I have lived, things have changed. And if things change, I think our laws and how we work on people should change. So the idea of New York being a sanctuary city was noble and novel in 2016. But in 2023, just being a sanctuary city and bossing people here is not enough. So we need to think, how do we be a sanctuary city that creates opportunity for people who come here to thrive and not just say that we're a sanctuary city, a slap on the wrist and bring people here on the media, taking credit for, for, for welcoming these people and not creating the circumstances for them to really thrive in that new society. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, I have to say, all of your comments really highlight how intersectional these struggles are. The concerns over housing, um, issues around sex work, um, access to services, access to benefits, um, discrimination from your employer or from uh, the landlord. Those are issues <coughs> that affect so many New Yorkers. And when you're an immigrant coming to this country and coming to this city and facing those issues, uh, it really highlights how much what we do can can help people of all different citizenship status. Um, and so uh, I wanted to ask you, Council Member Hanif, um, as chair of the New York City's Committee on Immigration, you know, you've really elevated many of these community concerns around the treatment of asylum seekers, and you've seen how these issues really intersect um, with challenges the city is facing across the board. You know, as Adafi was saying, where when it comes to housing, um, the shelter system, um, you know, a lot of these debates around the shelters have had to do with environmental justice and other problems that have been really highlighted by the scrambling that we've been doing um, and that the city has been doing over the last um, several months. Um, what role has the city council played here? And how can New York City be doing better from your perspective? Um, and how have you seen these issues around immigrant rights intersect with community needs more broadly? Thank you so much. And it's really wonderful to be on a panel with Julia and Adafe. And um, thank you, Professor Das, for this invitation. It's not um, regular for, for me to join with other folks who are experts in thinking and writing about what's happening and to be able to discourse together. So, Thank you for that, and also for everybody who's joined us uh, this afternoon um, for your commitment to uh, the legal component of this work, the policy components, the budget components, and potentially as future elected officials. So really just grateful to your commitment to our city and ensuring that our city um, really uh, delivers on its uh, commitment and principle for a sanctuary city. So. First, I'd just like to ask um, this room, do you see the administration, this is the mayor, as synonymous with the city council? So we acknowledge that there's a difference. And I think that's where my response is going to really shed light on because the city council's role is to hold the mayor, the administration, the city, those are the terms we use to describe the operations of uh, our response uh, to moments of uh, immigrants coming into our city or cuts to education infrastructure to divestments uh, within the police department. Um, and that distinction is important because that's how I see my role, that I am a council member or I became a council member because I see serious issues with how the city, the administration, um, responds to moments when we actually need security, safety, and strengthened investments for our most vulnerable communities that have consistently been sidelined. And 
historically we have seen this. So it is atrocious, it is unacceptable, it is unjustifiable um, why the Adams administration has continued to lean on the scarcity mindset, um, this crisis messaging as we welcome asylum seekers. So that's the first bit that I think the administration overall and of course, there are people, commissioners, who have responded with handshakes and being present at Port Authority uh, to ensure that our leadership overall um, demonstrates that we are not like the leaders on the southern borders, that we are not like these Republican governors. That has been done well. However, the larger message in uh, response and housing and ensuring that it's not simply a handshake that uh, that secures safety and um, home to asylum seekers. What are what else are we doing? And so the reason why I was so rooted in using my oversight capacity—that's really the most useful tool I have as the chair of the immigration committee. Um, to call the administration, because it's not a friendly relationship. I don't get to call up uh, the commissioner of the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, which is the agency, they're not quite an agency, uh, the, the office that comes to the hearings. And if you've been following, and thank you for watching that first hearing, the immigration committee is such a broad issue area that it is really unfair that the only administrative entity that joins those hearings by default is the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And, and so we have had to really think creatively, how do we bring the Office of Emergency Management? How do we bring um, the health and hospitals? Because uh, as Documented has reported, as has been reported, the administration has tried to carve out a shadow shelter system to house asylum seekers. We have created these relief centers that don't adhere to any right to shelter mandate parameters. And I have a legislation that is being introduced tomorrow. Uh, Alex here is from our team, also an NYU grad, uh, legislative director. Um, and we have this, uh, this legislation coming out tomorrow that would um, mandate that the city adhere to specific parameters around bed size, bed width, bathrooms per uh, few residents to um, prohibiting 1,000 bed facilities. They've basically created a shadow shelter system and said, well, we don't have to adhere to any rules here because they're being managed by the Office of Emergency Management and Health and Hospitals. And these other shelters emergency shelters, um, non herc relief center shelters are under the jurisdiction of Department of Homeless Services. So first, I've had to really call in these agencies to understand these intricacies, because why is it that they could build a tent city on Orchard Beach, which is a flood-prone location in our city, it, it is a transportation desert, there is no uh, community there, which school is there, um, how can we as New Yorkers accept that that is how uh, a dignified response looks like? And I remember upon that announcement, we were looking for allies to say like, this is wrong. And it was the mutual aid workers and mutual aid networks that were very clearly aligned with our narrative of this is not housing. This is not housing, this is, um, otherizing asylum seekers, putting them off to an island um, where they will be further struggling um, and not have resources at hand to work on work authorizations, asylum applications, enroll kids into schools, all of these other services that they need um, to succeed in our city. Um, we came out against that and, uh, and in time for a hearing to better understand, well, what is the operations for the relief centers? And in that hearing, and then concurrent hearings, um, which followed because in that hearing, they, their responses to my questions around housing validated that they were 100% circumventing the city's right to shelter decree. We focus on housing because as chair of the Immigration Committee, as a city council member uh, who is the 
Progressive Caucus co-chair, um, and the, with the values and experience I come from, I don't believe we need to be building shelters in the city. We need to stop warehousing people and families in the city's shelter system. And there are prohibitive rules that prevent um, folks from being moved into affordable, dignified, safe housing. And so our focus became really the umbrella of housing uh, policy. And uh, we've introduced legislation that removes the 90-day uh, prohibitive rule that is asked of families uh, to be able to qualify for our city FEPS voucher program, as an example. So there are intricate tools and policies we're looking at um, to remove folks from the shelter system and not create a shadow shelter system. Um, and that, that has really been uh, super important and to have the support of our Speaker Adams and leadership through the General Welfare Committee, we had a two-day hearing um, to further investigate um, and probe the Office of Emergency Management um, on the conditions of these tent cities. Um, and they again validated our concerns and did not respond to any um, of our questions around secure, safe housing for asylum seekers. And so we've now had to turn to legislation, but as you know, legislation um, takes time to move, even at the council level, and guess who gets to sign them off? The mayor. So the relationship with the executive um, has been quite fraught, and I have been on the offense. I have not been friendly to this administration, and I think uh, it's really contingent on us as New Yorkers to set the tone on what a progressive city looks like, what a city that is rooted in uh, building, strengthening uh, a representative democracy looks like. And that means um, uh, being rooted in uh, the narrative that I should be abolished that we must ensure integrity and dignity of asylum seekers, no matter who comes into our city, um, that they have access to protections. And so over the last several weeks, um, council members, cohorts of us, with some of our state partners, with some of our federal partners, have called um, for, uh, for the removal of the backlog of the work authorization piece. We have um, been following the housing concerns. Several of us stood uh, after a tour at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal, um, Herc, uh, it, against uh, the facility. I was there and about 600 um, men were already uh, residents of the terminal and it's horrible to see. It's, it's not, anyone can come in and say, no, this is not, I don't want, I wouldn't stay there. I don't want anyone to stay there. Um, so uh, to continue using our oversight powers is really important for me. Um, and seeing the rest of your question here, I mean, really, the, the, the issue on housing justice is, is prevalent here, and connecting our struggles with existing communities is critical here, because the other thing that the mayor has tried to do is pit communities against one another. After our two-day hearing, um, which is a committee on the whole, where every other agency that interacts with supporting asylum seekers or the agencies tasked with supporting um, welcoming asylum seekers were called to task. And the mayor was so upset at us that he basically, and it was in time for the release of our budget modification. He basically said, well, the city council can handle the response to asylum seekers. We're gonna pull money away, your discretionary dollars that we allocate to community partners and all of the various organizations supporting work in our districts. He's basically like, you're not getting discretionary dollars or use those discretionary dollars to support asylum seekers. So he has consistently showed us that he does not value uh, a sanctuary city. He does not value um, uh, our democratic values of strengthening this democracy. And so that's the fight ahead um, for, for me as chair and for this council to both push the council members, my colleagues, and also set the narrative when we were practically alone uh, speaking against the Orchard Beach, Randall's Island, and now still Brooklyn Cruise Terminal, um, bringing in uh, our outside partners, mutual aid workers, um, nonprofit partners, and advocates to the fold to really create pressure to move the larger council. So I've been proud of the work we've done together 
to call for transformation, not scarcity. Oh, thank you so much for that. And I, I know Adafi says you would like to. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a politician. I would love to be, <laughs> but you know, I, I think that New York City have a housing crisis. Asylum seekers are used as pawn in the housing crisis. In 2020, there were 80,000 people right. on the backlog for getting access to housing in New York City. And uh, recently, uh, our borough president, Mark Levine, Martin borough president, laid out this plan of each district, areas that are available to build housing. So I would not disagree with you in any way that we do need housing because asylum seekers that are coming here are part of the city. And if the city continue to have a housing crisis, it's making it almost impossible for these new people coming into the city to move above a certain level because they can't have a job in a place that they have to travel two hours to get to their job. Because you can't rent a place in New York City. You have to rent far, far in the Bronx or far, far in Queens. Because you can't assess some certain areas. They are priced out of those areas. So I think that housing justice is a big deal for our city to address. And that is a room that the Adams administration has to improve in, like ASAP. I'll just add, the council recognizes the the need to shelter folks. We recognize that and we consistently have reminded New Yorkers, this is a right to shelter city, which means on any given day, night, anyone can access our shelter system. However, the creation of the relief centers was told to us would be a triage, a triaging facility that anyone coming in would stay between 48 to 72 hours and with the expectation that this is a, a triage clinic and uh, the asylum seeker, individual or families, would be assessed around relocation to either a family member or to a city of their choice. And in that first hearing, we were certain, the council uh, as chair, certain that no one's leaving within 72 hours, that this was going to actually become a shadow shelter system. And now we have seen uh, with the hotel hercs, which the council supports and will continue to advocate for, um, that folks have been living there for weeks now. Um, and these folks did not come here to just uh, uh, deplete themselves in hotel rooms. Um, so that's the, the biggest piece, that the administration has not been transparent with the city council. They have not been partners, thoughtful partners with the city council. When they've assigned emergency shelters that are in within the 51 council districts, they've given us heads up maybe minutes before folks are going into um, the, the, the holiday inns of our city um, without any um, real notion that actually the council member in each district knows which community organizations are, are there doing the work. Um, or to be able to assemble our own team because we receive constituent cases and need to be prepared to be coordinated. Um, so that lack of transparency, proactive communication, um, and really uh, just apathy, it feels like, um, is really concerning. And so while we focus on um, calling for more transparency, and it's unfortunate that the only space I get to do that is under, having them under oath, um, and uh, but the larger values and the larger fights remain, well, how do we create a city that guarantees housing? How do we create a city that guarantees work and employment, including for our youngest New Yorkers through the um, Summer Youth Employment Program, um, and ensure that asylum seekers and all New Yorkers have access to healthcare coverage um, and are not getting attacked for those who are uh, trying to get abortions attacked by the strategic response group. Um, so there are so many pieces here that make this an issue of our larger and existing fights. And I don't want us to forget that um, because then we fall under very dangerous traps of pitting and otherizing certain communities against others. Yes, and thank you so much, council member, for calling so many people in because I think when, I think it, as, as a city, when we hear these policies being rolled out, um, 
and, and using the crisis language in constantly, uh, it's very easy to assume that there are barriers that are in place that just can't be insurmounted and that's why something looks the way it does when in fact these are really systematic problems that are existing that can be resolved if people are actually open, transparent, and collaborative. So thank, thank you for your, your leadership. I wanna make sure folks have time for questions. So if you do have questions from the audience, um, we welcome you to come to the mic and ask them um, and hope that you will take the opportunity to do so. Okay. Uh, yes, please please come to the mic just so that our um, folks who are watching on, on Zoom can hear. Thank you. And if you feel comfortable introducing yourself, that would be wonderful too. Yeah, so um, my name's Michaela, and I'm a project manager on the Ukrainian-Russian team for Respond Crisis Translation. We provide pro bono translations for asylum seekers and refugees. And while the work that we do is really amazing, and we've been able to provide like a lot of language services to people who have been denied language access, I've seen that just when there's like this need to rely on nonprofit organizations and sort of you know mutual aid groups, it's not enough. So I'm curious to ask the panel, what do you think more needs to be done in terms of language access? What can the city do? Thank you. I'm happy to start with that one. Um, something that I've heard from asylum seekers, which I think I mentioned briefly, was just having more language access or folks who speak their language in city shelters or some of these hotel hercs. Um, around the clock, so that could be a social worker who may speak Spanish or another language or anyone else in the shelter um, who's part of the staff there um, who they can communicate their needs with. Um, and at schools too, I think this is really important for language access. Um, I've heard from um, some parents and kids themselves um, who have said they've had to rely on other kids who speak Spanish and English um, in order to translate for them in class. And kids shouldn't um, have to be relying on, on other kids to translate from the teacher. And the city has um, hired more ESL teachers, but um, I think that's, that's an important point. Um, I've met you know, some parents who are, who are worried about their children in, in that respect. Obviously, kids learn fast, but in terms of you know, everything else that folks have, have had to go through, um, I think language access, um, especially with Spanish, that there are so many Spanish speakers in New York City, um, to really help find uh, folks who, who do um, speak these languages at schools and at shelters um, and at community events where um, asylum seekers are going every day and, and where they need the, these language services. Thank you. I can build on this. Mm -hmm. So for me, as somebody who comes from fighting for language access in my role as a tenant organizer when I was much younger, um, and also being from a, a, a homeland where we fought, Bangladesh fought for its independence rooted in um, preserving and being able to speak the Bangla language, but also seeing the Bangla language in government documents. And that fight has been a consistent struggle here in our city, and we've passed several laws that dictate that city agencies um, have to uh, translate materials in the top 10 languages. However, for me, while there's policy and we're gonna keep correcting policies that have proven to be very flawed, um, is that we, we funded um, last year uh, for the creation of worker cooperatives for language access services mm -hmm. and uh, a legal interpreter bank also rooted in the talent from our communities. And not to necessarily do the work of city agencies, but to support the work of our community organizations. Because yeah, our community groups and nonprofits are where our city, uh, city's most talented people are servicing our communities on the ground. And so uh, we need systems that really lay the foundation for a city to be, for our city to be a language justice city which means that our communities need to put in some more work in recognizing that the work for language access is paid work, that it is a driver of economic justice. It is so baffling to me to see that 
our city, I mean, the city council also, I had to recently fight to get a translation of a flyer that uh, that is a celebration of Bangladesh independence. Um, like we had to, I had to fight to get that translated. Um, but we rely on free translation providers and we have made it so that language access is seen, seen as like a volunteer thing that someone who works full time does um, when they have a few minutes at night. And that can't be the way in which we see language justice. And so right now is really the opportunity to focus on the circular economy, which is why I'm so rooted in the worker cooperative model to really train, bring in the folks who speak our languages across these community groups um, to be paid full time and see their role as champions of these languages. Um, and also be the ones deciding on how that language curriculum is built into their uh, organization's work, that the city's not dictating here's how to standardize th this language, because we know there are dialects, we know that there's colloquial terms, we know that there's reading, writing, comprehension issues. There's so much nuance to this issue that we can't sort of just demand that the city um, make some policy fixes, but rather, put in and secure the investments to support our language access coordinators and um, uh, folks in our schools and various institutions um, to be the experts driving this, this infrastructure. So that's where I see that work. And also as a former CUNY student, um, I see our public universities as, as opportunities for where we should have departments on languages that our communities speak. I know there's some schools that have language departments around interpretation and uh, language studies to do translation work, but we need to revive and see those as, as opportunities too. So there, this is a long-term um, vision, um, but those are some of my ideas that I raise within the, the parameters of the city council. But the city council and our, our work as a city um, is not quite enough um, to be tasked with fixing language justice. I just correct me if I'm wrong. The city council gives funding to that's right? right. So I remember at my shelter we had an elevator access problem for like older people going and coming, and my councilman took us to the city council to try. My councilman is now the borough president to try and get us funding for the elevator access. The city council funding process is like. Hell. That's right. Took us a year and six months <clears throat> to get the money. Almost impossible. So city council also have small funding they can give to nonprofits in their districts. But so many city council people do not give to immigration organizations in their council. If you look at their funding and who they give money to. Because the main reason is that those asylum seekers cannot vote. We are not a voting block. We are not a consistent. I will be a citizen this year, but I've been here for so long, I can't vote. I participate in the electoral process, trying to promote democracy and transparency. The city council do have funding that can support, aside from the mayor, some of the issues that these asylum seekers are facing. This current city council administration has not given funding to promote work of these current asylum seekers that were coming in. I remember the last city council under Corey Johnson, they did the right to universal um, legal representation in New York City. The city council passed that. Then the mayor gave a nod to it. So I think that in, as regards to access to language or funding or support, the city council can also use from their funding to support some of this work aside from the mayor. Because each people have jurisdiction. City council is like our local government. Many people will focus on the mayor, which is like, like the president of the city. His eyes is on everywhere. Why Mayor Adams is very political in the sense that all politicians are political in how they portray their things. This current city council have not given funding to support asylum seekers that are coming in. That is also a way to give more access. So if the mayor does, the city council does, the um, state legislator representing that city district does, 
there will be more access for people. Because I think the moment we stop thinking about asylum seekers as non-voting block and only people we can use as pawn to gain political weight, we would start acting in their best interest. At this point, the city does not act in the best interest of asylum seekers, both at the mayor level and both at city council. The mayor uses asylum seekers as a way to get in front of a nuanced audience to make his voice being heard. I am not afraid to ruffle feathers because I think there's so many asylum seekers like myself are afraid to say these things because they, they don't have the right documentation. They're afraid they cannot become a part of the society. They're afraid to hear the, allow their voices being heard. So I think that this current city council is just two more years is done. They have to play a role in providing some of the funding they have to support asylum seekers in their community, help the local nonprofit. I used to run a nonprofit, very small nonprofit in, on the Upper West Side. A councilman took my hand and went. So they have LGBTQ caucus, they have immigration caucus. So he took my hand and introduced me to Carlos Mancheca, the councilman that were in the LGBTQ caucus, Van Bruma in Queens, and said, Hey, this guy is a gay guy, an immigrant rights activist. He runs a local nonprofit in my district. I want us to find him money to help the people he helped. How can we do that? I think that that is also a part of action. Bring people into the room, introduce them to people, give them access for their voices to be heard so that this issue is not just only the mayor. It can also be an issue of like everybody that is playing a role in our cities being governed. That's what I think. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I think it, it's so true just as the city itself isn't a monolith. Um, uh, you know, the mayor's office, and, and it changes with time. There have been times where city council has a very close relationship with the mayor's office for immigrant affairs and times where they haven't. City council members are not a monolith either, and I think there are many who could do much more. Um, and I did want to take the opportunity to thank council member Hanif, who I think has been one of those city council members who has taken the hand of people in the community and walked them to where they need to be and, um, and helped many uh, people who, who have been targeted um, by, by ICE and by uh, the system uh, to get them the resources they need. So thank you for being, for being one of the good ones who's been really helping us. And thank you, Adafi, for calling um, uh, in uh, city council members who need to be doing more. Um, I think I saw another hand in the audience. Um, I guess, please come up. Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Kayla Yoon. I'm a second year here. Um, I'm one of the student leaders for our International Refugee Assistance Group and a research assistant for Professor Das. Um, I think I'm most curious about how you respond to people who promote the crisis and scarcity rhetoric, especially people who, you know, see funding and devoting funding and resources for asylum seekers and non-citizens as taking away those same resources from people, like from citizens when it comes to like housing, when it comes to a lot of important social services. And I think this is an area that I'm also struggling to respond to when people raise these issues. So I was wondering how you, know, you, go, you would um, respond to these. Thank you. I'm happy to speak a little bit from the media perspective because I think, as we all know, um, I would say the media definitely propagates this um, at points. And so I think, you know, when we see articles in, in different papers, but for example, the New York Post, I would say a main one in terms of like really pushing forward this narrative that asylum seekers are kind of taking away from, from other folks in the city. Um, what we try to do at Documented Always is center the voices of the asylum seekers themselves and hopefully give them a space to um, just speak freely um, about the challenges um, they're facing uh, without, uh, you know, really taking care of the language we use in our stories um, in terms of, for example, the word crisis or flood or wave, um, that kind of language that can um, push forward these narratives that can be more political as opposed to 
um, you know, just really uh, looking at the stories of, of the folks who are coming here and what they're going through and um, holding the city accountable um, in media coverage for what the city can do better and what they are doing well as well. Um, so anyways, from a media perspective, at, at Documented, we try our best um, to uh, be careful with our language and in interviews, um, yeah, just really give asylum seekers the space and, and center their voices in the best way we can. I'm sure we can do better, um, but I do try and do that in my own reporting. I want to thank you for the work you do. I think that there's so many people that will be listening that do not know much about local politics. I think it's good we use opportunities like this to shine a light on the work that people can do. So. I really appreciate you like giving us an insight into the work you do. It's very, very important for us to be able to do works like this because I think that the root cause of like the restriction in our city budget is people thinking that the resources are not actually being used properly and providing oversight is a way to be like, this is actually what we use it for and this is why it's not enough. If I have to defend why people should assess resources, I will be biased <laughs> because I am an asylum, I was an asylum seeker myself. I, I do think that there's a genuine fear in the US and it's rubbing off in, the, in New York also, that it is going to be a minority majority country of like more people of color and less white people. And New York is growing towards a majority people of color city. And there's this genuine fear that migration is one of the means in which uh, the demographics change in a very fast paced way. So there's an underlining fear that comes with the idea of helping people that are not like us or people that are like us. So it, if I'm advocating, I'm advocating that people like me should be helped. <laughs> and there are people that are like, why wouldn't you say that you, you, you obviously need help? But there's this mentality of like, these people are coming here, they have bad experiences instead of something bad happened to these people. I think language is very important and language shape how people <clears throat> are being treated. The language we use is these people need help. And that language promotes we can choose to help or we can choose not to help. But if we say that these people are part of us, that means we have to support ourselves. Because the idea of like not choosing to use that resources is creating more people that will become a burden on our system. But providing support, we are creating people that will become a part of making our system more economically buoyant. I am a contributor in this society. But if I say the things I have done, it's like being an ableist. Like, I came here, I did it. Some people don't do it. And that is the example people give. Like, why can't you be like this immigrant that came here and da-da-da-da-da? And that is also like segmenting what kind of immigrants deserve to come to America. So there's an underlining tone of like, who is deserving to come here and who is not. And it's, it is with that tone, we treat people that come here. For example, I'm not trying to like pit one against another. Syrian, Afghan, people from predominantly Muslim countries coming to America do not receive the same treatment like people who are coming from Ukraine, for example. I did work with the Biden administration on the relocation of Afghan across the 50 states. I traveled across the country. There's like strong Islamophobia in America. And that language translates to the treatment of people that come here. So why should we help them? They don't deserve to be helped when we ourselves need help instead of why don't we support them so that our system can be healthier. So that is the advice I do give to people. Like, you are not helping me. Mm -hmm. You can't help me. I help myself. You provide the system that enable me to contribute to the society because I am the only one that can help myself. 
Even though you try to help me, I can decide to lay on the couch all day and you can't do anything about that. Helping me is giving me a shelter to stay or giving me SNAP benefits and I have to make only 15,000 a year. Supporting me is providing the structure that enables me to thrive in that society. And I think that that is the language I like to use is that how can we support them to be able to thrive rather than help them to be a part of our society. And you will have the final word before we close. Great. I'll just respond to Dafe. Um, certainly, the city council as a structure is a rotten structure. I, I decided to go into a system that is rotten. However, I uh, also am from a community that has not been represented in the city council nor in government, and also a believer in, a, in circular economies, in a participatory democracy, and a community control of budgets. So. When when I set out to figure out what does my office look like in the very few years that I have, it is for this vision that has guided me um, following the various catalysts that brought me into this work. And I've been on, I've served as, I've worn various hats. But um, I do see uh, the urgency for uh, the action, not just like, which is why to your uh, question on language access, my response was, yeah, the city council is not enough. The administration is not enough. And so it is this call to action that actually, what are our communities doing? How are our communities responding when they are seeing that tent cities, tents are being created in outdoor places with no transit access, with no response around, well, will there be shuttles or buses? Um, with this lack of transparency that, which for me requires that our communities rise up. And so there's a Bangla uh, poem, and this was during the revolutionary period of Bangladesh um, from a poet, Ghazi Nozrul Islam, who in his poem um, says in Bangla, Amra judi na jagi ma kemne shakal hove. If we don't rise, and he's talking to his mother, um, how will it be morning? And I think about that because in the grand scheme of things, my role in the council um, can be critiqued in so many ways. However, I see myself as a soldier from when I was a young 17-year-old who needed to navigate our city's nebulous healthcare system as somebody who was born in Brooklyn with parents who migrated from Bangladesh, didn't know English, navigating our nebulous healthcare system being shuffled from public hospital to the next, figuring out my diagnosis with lupus. That catalyst drove me to now 15 years later in this role. So I see myself as a soldier for these big visions we have for our city to be one that lives up to its values of progressive principles and in the fight for a stronger democracy. So whether it's where from where you're sitting as students in this program or part of this clinic as legal practitioners to elected officials, we are struggling together and constantly need to be held accountable because unilaterally, neither of us have more power than the other. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the larger topics that I don't get to really talk about or debate um, around, which are so important um, to this conversation about how do we set up a, a city um, that is rooted in our care and not and rooted in our care and joy and happiness and not abandonment. Um, so I will leave you with those parting words. Well, thank you all for um, your incredible insights um, and for being here today. Thanks to our audience. Um, I'm sure many of you are interested in figuring out ways that you can help um, asylum seekers. Documented actually, I think today or this week, has a story about ways that people can volunteer and help. I'm sure um, uh, with the council member and Madafi, you can reach out to them about ways you can support their work. Um, and please uh, get Adafi's book, which is an incredible book. Um, and we thank you all for being here. Thanks.